Amen. Amen. Wow. Wow. Well, I was going to ask if you guys were fired up tonight, but that is already evident. Amen. Hey man, you guys are fired up, and I'm excited too, hey amen? And you know, for us, as real Christians, we believe that each one of us, we need to have a special walk with God. That, that we're coming out here, and this is not the first time we've been in the Word today. At least I hope it's not. I hope it's not. This is, the not, this is not the first time that we've had some fellowship with God today. And when you really walk with God, it's amazing what God does in your life. It's amazing what God does with you. And I just want to preach tonight my quiet time, amen? You ever have a quiet time that's like, man, I just got to preach that right there. I know Albert's having those quiet times. He's, re he's ready to go. Let's go to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. You know, I'm going through 1 uh, and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles in the, in the Word. And I hope everybody will read through the whole Bible in a year. I do that every year. It's amazing. And we got to be people who love the Word of God. You know, Bible studies is what got us into the church. It needs to be what keeps us in the church. Amen. Second Chronicles 18. It's going to go a little old school. And in verse 1, we're going to see what's going on right here. It says, Now Jehoshaphat had great wealth and honor, and he allied himself with Ahab by marriage. Some years later, he went down to see Ahab in Samaria. Ahab slaughtered many sheep and cattle for him, and the people with him and urged him to attack Ramoth Gilead. Ahad, king of Israel, asked Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied, I am as you are, and my people as your people. We will join you in the war. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, first seek the counsel of the lords. So the king of Israel brought together the prophets, 400 men, and ask them, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or shall I not? Go, they answered, for God will give it into the king's hands. But Jehoshaphat asked, is there no longer a prophet of the Lord here whom we can inquire of? The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat, there is still one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. I hate him. Because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. He is Micaiah, son of Imlah. The king should not say such a thing, Jehoshaphat replied. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Bring Micaiah, son of Imlah, at once. Dressed in their royal robes, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones at the threshing floor by the entrance of the gate of Samaria, with all the prophets prophesying before them. Now Zedekiah, son of Canaanah, had made iron horns, and he declared, This is what the Lord says. With these you will gore the Arameans until they are destroyed. All the other prophets were prophesying the same thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead and be victorious, they said. For the Lord will give it into the king's hands. The messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, Look, the other prophets, without exception, are predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with theirs and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, as surely as the Lord lives, I can tell him only what my God says. When he arrived, the king asked him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Remoth Gilead or shall I not? Attack and be victorious, he answered, for they will be given into your hands. The king said to him, how many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? There's a lot going on right here. You've got Ahab. 
And if you don't know, Ahab is a wicked kink. He's a wicked kink. Jehoshaphat is a little more spiritual right there. He wants to inquire of God. He wants to have quiet times. He wants to pray. And they're going to go to war, and Jehoshaphat's like, hey, if we're going to do this, we need God with us. Because I know that victory comes from God and God alone. And he's like, okay, no problem. I've got 400 prophets here, ready to go. What's the only issue? They're false prophets. The only problem is they're prophesying lies. And Jehoshaphat is like, hey, these guys are just saying what you want to hear, man. Is there not any longer a prophet of the Lord's? He's like, you know what? There is still one. But I hate this guy. I can't stand this guy. He never has any good news. It's just bad news about me. He doesn't tell me anything encouraging. He doesn't tell me what I want to hear. I hate this guy. And Jehoshaphat said, no, 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 no. Let's go get him. Micaiah comes, and he prophesies to him, and he tells him what he wants to hear at first just to show him how far off he is. And to show Ahab that he already knew what the truth was. And Ahab responds. He says, hey, I swore to you. I made you swear to me that you would tell me nothing but the truth. (laughs) Ahab said he wanted the truth. He said he wanted nothing but the truth. But we know that that was just a lie. But for us here tonight, as disciples of Jesus Christ, as real Christians... We want nothing but the truth, amen? We we don't want the facades. We don't want the false doctrine. We don't want the shenanigans. We don't want everything that looks good, but you know it's really bad. We want nothing but the truth, amen? And that's a title of my lesson tonight, Nothing But The Truth. Nothing But The Truth. If you're visiting with us tonight, you've come out, and we're going to preach to you nothing but the truth. Amen? Let's keep on reading. Verse 16. My car's like, okay, if that's what you want, I'm going to give it to you. If that's what you want, be careful what you ask for. Then my car answered, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, these people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you that he never prophesied anything good about me but only bad? (laughs) Micaiah continued, therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven standing on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab, king of Israel, into attacking Ramoth Gilead and going to his death there. One suggested this and another that. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked. I will go and be a deceiving spirit in the mouths of all his prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. So now the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. Right here, Micaiah lays out the truth. He says, you want the truth? Here's the truth. You're going to die. You're going to die. And how is it going to happen? By all these false prophets deceiving you. That you're going to buy into the lie. You're going to subscribe to it. And that's going to lead you to your death. And Ahab really hates this guy. And he hates him because he's speaking the truth. You know, our first point tonight is simply, they hate the truth. They hate the truth. The truth is, guys, that people really hate the truth. People hate it. People today would rather hear something comfortable. They would rather hear something that's going to appease them, that's going to make them feel good. People don't enjoy the truth. Why? Because it's hard to swallow. The truth is reality. It's it's challenging at times. And people don't want to really come face to face with that and face what really is 
the truth. You know, what is the truth today? What is the truth about the world that we live in? That it's dark, that it's hurting, and that it's helpless. We live in a time that it's, we've had the most money we've ever had. And yet two-thirds of the population are living in world hunger. We live in a time where the racism is running rampant. And people hate each other because of a skin tone. We live in a time where depression and suicide is the highest it's ever been. That people are so down and so sad that the greatest killer of themselves is themselves. That's the truth of the world. And people don't want to hear it. They'd rather sit in their mansions, their comfortable life, and, and watch a Netflix show, maybe Stranger Things right there, I don't know. They'd rather focus on that, because if they really come to grips with what's going on, they would have to take some responsibility and do something about it. You know, it's even worse in the religious world today. It's even worse in the religious world. What's, this, what's the truth about the religious world? You've got 40,000 different denominations in one Bible. How does that make sense? You got one of these in 40,000 denominations where people go to church based on what church is closest to their house. People go to church based on the way that the, the preacher dresses. If he's got ripped jeans, if he's got some vans, if he drinks coffee bean, man, I got to go to that guy right there. Because there must be some Holy Spirit in the coffee bean. Man, I got to listen to this guy. People go to the church closest to their comfort rather than the church that is closest to the Bible and God. And you've got deceiving spirits. You know, this scripture really rings true. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, it says, For the time will come. When people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to miss. You know, you got the deceiving spirits today. You've got people preaching, hey, you got to pray to Mary and the saints. You got people preaching prosperity gospel. If you want to be really rich, that's what Christianity is. You got people preaching all kinds of things, and it's just deceiving the masses. It's deceiving the people. And yet for us in this room, as God's people, as those who we've faced reality, we've faced the truth. They hate the truth, but we love the truth. Amen? Man, but do you remember the first time the truth really hit you? You know what I mean? Man, we love it now. We love it now. But man, it was a Mack truck to the face. A facial. Like you were getting smacked right there. And it was maybe discipleship, it was maybe l and I don't know. Man, if you were humble, it was discipleship. If you were prideful, it was l and you know what I mean? Like, it's like, if you, hey, if you were prideful at discipleship, it's like, yeah, I'm a disciple. Well, you don't even know how to spell disciple. What are you talking about? Like, what? That's, that's for you to know. I don't know you. That's for you to know. But the first time that you really grasped the state of things and the reality of what we have going on here, the, the, the masses that are being led astray, the spiritual war that we are really in, and to face that, you know, in John 8 it says, hey, you've got to hold to the teachings, and if you do that... You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free, but it's going to make you miserable first. The truth will make you miserable. The truth will make you miserable before it sets you free. 
Because when you face that and you see the truth, the pain that sets in. What about my family? What about my friends? What about all these people I've grown up with? And when you face that, and everybody has to face that, and yet when you overcome that and you make a decision, why does it set you free? Because you make a decision to do something about it. That you're going to stand up for what's true. That you're going to stand up for what's right. That the whole world might be led astray, but we're going to fight back to save this world. Amen? You know, that's who we are. Even in this time, there was 400 false prophets. There was one prophet of God. And for us in this room, we don't subscribe with the 400. We don't buy into that. We are the one people, the one church, the one campus ministry that we are fighting back for the truth. And we got to save this world. Amen. They hate the truth, but we love it. You know, I want to challenge you, though. Everybody, we, we love the truth. Love the truth in your D times. You don't, 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 don't be a lawyer in your D times. Don't, don't lawyer up for yourself and say, you don't understand the situation I was in. You don't understand that the time, the place is setting and it, dude, you were in sin. You got to repent. That's the bottom line. Love the truth in your D time. Amen. Let's keep it moving here. Let's go to verse 23. Verse 23, and in verse 23, it says, Then Zedekiah, son of Canana, went up and slapped Micaiah in the face. Mm. 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 It, was, it was the Oscars. It was Will Smith right there. It was, it was, a, t- it was a tough time. Which way did the spirit from the Lord go when he went for me to speak to you, he asked. Micaiah replied, you will find out on the day you go hide in an inner room. The king of Israel then ordered, take Micaiah and send him back to Ammon, the ruler of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. And say, this is what the king says. Put this fellow in prison and give him nothing but bread and water until I return safely. Micaiah declared... If you ever return safely, the Lord has not sp- spoken through me. Then he added, mark my words, all you people. Oh, <laughs> Micaiah is here. And he preaches the truth. And man, it feels good to preach the truth. You're on campus and you preach the truth. But then you get slapped in the face. And then he got some opposition right here. And he got some persecution. Our second point tonight, they oppose the truth. Persecution is a guarantee. It's a guarantee. We know this. We've been persecuted. We've got people on this campus looking out for our Bible studies. Man, are they sitting by with anybody? Let me go tell that person how to study with them. Let me tell that person. We got the other clubs on campus thinking we're a cult. We got the persecution. We got it. And let me tell you something. We are not faced for one second. Amen? Why do you think Satan's going after us? Why? Because he doesn't like what we're doing. He hates it. He's ticked off at what's going on. He's like, man, I got to stop this group right here. If I can persecute them, if I can get them to get scared and shut their mouths, man, I'm going to stop what's going on. But we're not phased for a second. You know, why are the groups not, the other groups not getting any persecution? Why? Why? Because nothing's going on in that group. Nothing's happening. There's no change. There's no repentance. And yet you come here and lives change. You come here and chains are broken. You come here and people get freed spiritually. 
and really get a relationship with God, and it ticks Satan off, but we're fired up. Amen. Yeah. Opposition is good for us. Yeah. I, want, I want you to buy into that. Because everything that we, we grow believing wants you to believe that we need comfort. Opposition is good for you. If God has placed opposition in your life, that means that he wants you to grow. Opposition equals growth. And guys, opposition is not just persecution. We're going to face some opposition this upcoming fall semester with our classes, amen? I know, man, fi finals week comes around. Man, it gets tough. Finals week, some you, man, you, you're locked in right there. We're going to get opposition. Maybe some of us will lose a job. Now, now the thing is, did you deserve to lose it? <laughs> because showing up late consistently time and time and time again, that's not spiritual. And, it, <laughs> and you can't come say, bro, I got persecution. I, I got fired from my job. No, that was you being derelictal. You got to repent. Maybe we'll have financial strength. And Lord forbid. Lord forbid if the interest isn't mutual. Amen. Man. Man. <laughs> Some of us, man. <laughs> Some of us, the interest isn't mutual. Bro. <laughs> you go into hiding for a week. You're just like, <laughs> where's this brother at? Man. You're at home on the bed face down. <laughs> listening to listening to Nelly or Usher or something and like or to Drake and simping, and you're just like, bro. I, I can't take it. But for each of us, God is going to put opposition in our life so that our threshold can increase. All of us, what do we want to do? We want to live to the fullest extent that God can use us. Nobody in this room wants to live a mediocre life for God. No way. That's not who we are. We want to live life to the full. We want to be pushed beyond our limits. That God will use us to do great things. And that's only going to come through opposition and for us to grow. You know, some of us are emotionally immature. Some of us, some of us are. Some of us, guys, some of us get discouraged easily. Some of us do. Over small things. Over small things. Somebody said no to you when you shared your faith. You're down. So, so, some of us, guys, we just get, we just get sad time too quick. We get discouraged too quick. Do you understand that God is really sovereign? Romans 8, 28, God works all things for our good. But some of us are acting emotionally like God's not in control, but Satan is. And, like, we believe that. And, like, man, in my life, it woe to me. I suck, and I can't do this, and, and life is hard, and oh, my gosh. What are we talking about? God is totally sovereign. That means everything that has happened in your life up to this point, God has allowed for you to grow. Yeah. It's for you. It's good. You know, discouragement is one of the most irreverent sins that there is. Being discouraged is one of the, the most irreverent things you can do. Why? Because it means that the cross is not enough for you. It means the cross is not enough. Guys, as, as baptized disciples, we have salvation. Everything else is a gift. 
everything else. And for us to get sad to time because somebody said no or get discouraged because something happened, it means that you're not focused on the cross, but you're focused on what's going on down here. And we've got to mature spiritually right here and emotionally. Amen? we got to persevere. You know, for some of us, we're a little familiar with opposition. And, uh, you know, I know this because we played football yesterday. <laughs> and let's just say our brother Chamizi was really chirping right there. <laughs> he, he was really talking, you know. And I was like, bro, I'm not about the talking. I'm about the action right here. I'm not about the talking. And, and, and Chamizi, he was like, bro, I played safety in high school, bro. You don't, you don't want these problems. He's like, I'm a ball hawk. I'm like, I'm like, bro, here's the thing. If 28-year-old dad bod with a kid and another one on the way shows you up, I just want to guard your heart. <laughs> I, just, I just want to guard your heart. I just want to guard. I just want to guard hearts. And I'm just saying, there was a play. And it was Chamizi and our brother Derek. Derek? Drew? Zero? And our brother and our brother Zero out there. And it was and it was them one on one. And Chimizi was facing some, some opposition. Chimizi was facing some opposition. I was a quarterback. And I, I just saw Zero out there and Chimizi's over there. I'm like, oh, it's on. It's on. Threw it up. God bless the ball. And zero flat toward it, scored a touchdown right there, man. I just, I just, I just wondering, bro. I, I, I want to help you out. I want to, want to. We got to be humble. We got to be humble, amen. But Chimizi knows some opposition. But let me tell you, Chimizi didn't get discouraged, amen. He's fired up. <laughs> Guys, what is opposition? What does it produce? What is the thing that we feel so strongly about that, that is challenging? It's pressure. Yes, sir. Opposition is pressure. Yes, sir. And when we go through opposition, we feel the pressure, and we don't like it, so we try to take ourselves out of the pressure. But we got to keep ourselves in the pressure. Yeah. Every one of you guys, we're going to go to the wedding tomorrow. It's going to be amazing. And you're going to see Dylan put the ring on the finger. And it's locked. All the sisters are like this. All the sisters are like, man, I want my ring. And he's going to put that ring on the finger. And let me tell you something. There's going to be a diamond on that ring. And we all, the sisters, we love diamonds. You guys love diamonds. It's awesome. We want to give you diamonds. It's incredible. But how, how does a diamond get made? It's pressure. A diamond starts off as a piece of coal. A piece of coal. That's not really good for much. That's why people get it for Christmas when they're disobedient. It's not really worth much. But when you apply enough pressure on a piece of coal for enough time, it becomes a diamond. You know, what is God trying to do with the pressure in your life? He's trying to make you into a diamond. He's trying to make you into, it's not because he's mean, it's not because he's upset. He wants you to reach your potential and become a diamond for him to do great things, amen? <laughs> Guys, this is what we've done. This is who we are. We've had pressure. And what has been the result? We've sent out 30 leaders to L.A. and Oklahoma. <laughs> We now have Texas disciples in L.A. and a whole mission team got sent out to that great city in Oklahoma City. Amen. It's what we've done. It's who we are that we, we apply the pressure. We get the pressure applied to us and we flat overcome. And yet that's what we have to continue to do. That as we face opposition, as we face the pressure, we're going to persevere, and God is going to continue to do amazing things. 
we're going to see tons and tons and tons of students get baptized. We're going to get to UNT and TCU, amen? We're going to have more cops raise on up in a great way. We're going to have more people go into the full-time ministry. And we are flat going to take this land for God here in DFW, amen? I want to challenge you. Don't let any opposition take you out. And never, never, never get discouraged. You can, you can have some feelings. You can feel sad. But you've got to go feel sad with God. And then rejoice always in the Lord. Amen? Let's keep moving here. In verse 28, we've got one more point. Quick one. Verse 28. It says, so the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will enter the battle in disguise, but you wear your royal robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Now the king of Aram had ordered his chariot commanders, do not fight with anyone small or great except the king of Israel. When the chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat, they thought this is the king of Israel. So they turned to attack him. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him. God drew them away from him, for when the chariot commander saw that he was not the king of Israel, they stopped pursuing him. But someone drew his bow at random and hit the king of Israel between the breastplate and the scale of armor. The king told the chariot driver, wheel around and get me out of the fighting. I've been wounded. All day long, the battle raged, and the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot facing the Arameans until evening. Then at sunset, he died. This is all God. He tries to disguise himself. Somebody draws a bow at random and hits him between the breastplate and the scale armor. That's like that much room. What God says always comes true. What God says always comes true. And that's our third point. The truth always prevails. You know, they can hate the truth. They can oppose the truth. But the truth always prevails. It doesn't matter what the odds are stacked up against us. It doesn't matter what the situation is. The truth always prevails. Even in Matthew 16, 18, it says, And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Not even hell. Not even hell can overcome us as disciples. We are doomed to victory. Look around. Look around at this group. We are victorious. Right now, tonight, this is who we are. We're not, we're not walking around defeated. We're not walking around down. We are those who are victorious in the Lord. You know, I want to challenge you. If you've been struggling, remember, the truth always prevails. If you've been struggling and facing persecution and sentimentality, the truth always prevails. If you've been challenged with discouragement, the truth always prevails. Whatever the opposition is, the truth always prevails. You know, as a family, as we fight this fight, as we persevere, as we become more and more victorious, we're going to win the Metroplex, we're going to win Texas, we're going to win the USA, and eventually we're going to get to the whole wide world. Amen? Amen.